It's 1963. The superhero and comic book craze has taken off at full speed, with big names like Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four entering the fray as big contenders. The arrival of both of these titles in subsequent years is something that was, and to some degree, still is unprecedented in the world of comic books. American News was still firmly in control of the periodicals market. If you were looking to step into the veritable comics arena anytime after 1938, you had two choices for distribution. Try to make it on your own or sign a demonic pact with American News. Publisher Martin Goodman chose the former, and he didn't do all that poorly, but somewhere along the line, the dollar signs must have attracted him to American News. And it was a rough go, because American News got hit with antitrust lawsuits soon after and went bankrupt seemingly overnight. Enter National Periodical Publications distribution arm Independent News. Who made up this company, you might ask? Well, that's none other than the present-day DC Comics. Yes, the progenitors of names like Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman, and many, many others. Goodman eventually inked a deal with Independent, agreeing to have his issues distributed by them. It's crazy to think the same folks who published today's most popular DC names also published Marvel titles once upon a time from 1957 to 1969. But this agreement wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. See. Independent wasn't all that interested in Martin's aspirations of comic book greatness. Instead, they were more desirous of Goodman's magazine work. So, they limited him to just eight comic book publications a month. Truth is, Goodman had a proclivity for following the trends, and this put him at odds with the higher-ups at any company with which he might be doing business. The trend at this time was comic books, and so Independent felt they needed to stymie what would have likely been an overflow of knockoff superhero titles very early on. Pretty smart, honestly, that they wanted to protect the image and status of their big-name characters. Eventually, Goodman got permission to increase his stable of monthly publications to 10, up from the original 8. He then placed a call to Stan the Man Lee. Goodman knew exactly what he wanted from the two new titles and relayed this to Lee. The two new offerings from Marvel were to be knockoffs of the company's most popular titles, the aforementioned Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. If it wasn't obvious by now, Goodman was a profit-seeking capitalist, the likes of which you'd probably be simultaneously impressed by and angry with. Hello, I like money. A double-edged sword, Goodman brought a wealth of new characters to the Marvel Armory through his creative compatriots in Lee, Steve Ditko, and Jack Kirby. Keeping up with all those personalities was tough, but you could argue Goodman was instrumental in helping lay the foundation for what would eventually become the Marvel Universe. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. At any rate, Independent and Marvel moved forward with plans for the two new comics. The names of these two new series? X-Men was to be the copy of Fantastic Four, and Daredevil was meant to be a new incarnation of Spider-Man. The connection becomes apparent when you compare the Fantastic Four and X-Men's most notorious baddies. Magneto and Doctor Doom share many similarities right down to their appearance. There's also the issue of how the Hulk and the Thing basically fill the same team roles. But if that wasn't enough, the X-Men's inspiration is right there on the cover. Even Daredevil was meant to follow in the footsteps of Spider-Man, and Daredevil wasn't even a completely new idea. The copyright had simply lapsed for his similarly named precursor, which first came to the limelight in 1940 through Silver Streak No. 6. So, nearly every idea in this new era of Marvel was in some shape or form a remix of prior characters or groups. But Daredevil was happening. Lee scrambled to get his ducks in a row, first approaching longtime compatriot Steve Ditko. He initially turned Lee down, we can only assume he didn't feel quite right copying someone else's idea so blatantly. Lee eventually marketed the idea to Jack Kirby, who, albeit begrudgingly, signed on for the initial conception of Daredevil and the first few issues. The feeling was apparently mutual, as Lee felt Kirby was too busy to work on the new comics. Lee approached Submariner creator Bill Everett. Everett wasn't even working in the industry at the time, and long story short, he ended up, quote unquote, not having the time, same as Kirby.
The truth is, is that all of this shuffling around had severely hampered the production process for Daredevil number one. You see, back in those days, you paid for your printing time and product even if you didn't print any of that product. Stan, scrambling to figure out how to keep Daredevil alive, went to Jack Kirby once again. They couldn't simply move one of their publications over to the new slot because each one had their own press dates. This meant that whatever filled that slot had to be a brand new title. With only a smattering of time available until press date, Kirby and Lee looked to their stable of already established characters. And finally, it was time to assemble. It was the Avengers that came out of the woodwork. Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, Ant-Man, and the Wasp all jumped to center stage in a team-up like the world had never seen. And yes indeed, it spawned one of the biggest franchises ever published. Even the Avengers' opening act villain was a character already well known to audiences, Thor's half-brother, Loki. And so Marvel had pulled off the incredible gambit of killing two birds with one stone, making press date, and creating a new publication out of thin air. It just so happened that X-Men number one and Avengers number one both debuted on September 1st, 1963. Daredevil, which would continue to suffer setbacks under artist Bill Everett, wouldn't see store shelves until the next year. Lee eventually had to turn to those he was working with more closely to get the issue ready for publishing, and Everett's footprint on Daredevil scattered across a few different Marvel employees. The truth is mixed up in between stories from Lee, Kirby, and Kirby's former assistant, Mark Evanier. In a 2007 interview, Evanier tried to clear up some of the controversy. But Everett must have been fun at parties, because for all of his faults, he was back to penciling for Marvel within two years, although not necessarily on the Daredevil project itself. At any rate, The Man Without Fear finally made it to store shelves six months late. Rumors suggest that Goodman might have used his publishing slots to creatively ensure that Daredevil got out the door, continuing his antics as an extremely effective and crafty leader. Of course, Daredevil proved to be a riotous success, and he's still consistently ranked as one of Marvel's most visually arresting and thoughtful characters to date. Like the characters that make up the Marvel Universe, the folks who created it are every bit as diverse and interesting an array. Everett's moody productivity, often the special ingredient of greatness, straight-shooting stalwart Steve Ditko, who helped bring the web-slinger to life, the exploding artistic talents of Kirby, whose images changed comic books forever, quiet but rambunctious Goodman, whose money-grubbing ways made many of these titles possible, and, of course, Lee's inexorably intoxicating personality, as vital to Marvel's brand as the comic books themselves. Truly, Excelsior. If you have an idea that you genuinely think is good, don't let some idiot talk you out of it. If there is something that you feel is good, something you want to do, something that means something to you, try to do it. Because I think you can only do your best work if you're doing what you want to do, and if you're doing it the way you think it should be done. And if you can take pride in it after you've done it, no matter what it is, if you can look at it and say, I did that, and I think it's pretty damn good.